for joining us. I really appreciate you taking a few moments of your time to join us here every Wednesday. I hope you're having a really good week. We are really enjoying revivals. The Lord is blessing. He's given us strength, giving me strength. And I am very, very, very thankful for that. I, I hope to tell you more about it later, but the Lord has, he's certainly been good to me. I want to read to you and talk to you just a few minutes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, beginning with verse 16 and reading verse 17. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw Jesus eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? And I've, I've said it over and over and over. When you, when you hear the Pharisees saying sinner or saying publican, you got to put a little venom in it. You got to put some some spit in it. They they were really this was a super criticism for them. They are sinners. They're publicans. And unfortunately, I've heard that emphasis even in our churches when we talk about people who are not Christians, who are not saved, and they are by definition they are sinners just like we were sinners, but sometimes we forget that's where he brought us from. And it is a low place and it is a bad place, but hey, they have just as much potential to be forgiven from that sin as we did. And I thank God for it. But here's the, here's the Pharisees with their, with their uppity, better than you appetite or appetite. Man, I must be hungry. <laughs> attitude, their, their uppity attitude. Why is he eating? Why is, why is Jesus fellowshipping with sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Christ came to call sinners to repentance. One of my favorite New Testament verses to preach from, and I've preached it in, in probably hundreds of services in churches and especially under the blue and white gospel tent. Christ came to save sinners. This is a this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul said, of whom I am chief. You hear no venom coming from Paul when he speaks about these sinners. You hear no, you hear no downward talk to them. He's not condescending to them. He says, I was just like them. Christ came. The reason he came into this world is to save sinners of whom I am chief. And here, he, Jesus says it like this. I didn't come to call the righteous. I didn't come, time, I didn't come to spend all my time with people who, who didn't need me, who already had righteousness. I came for those that need a savior. I came to call them to repentance. And that's, I, I want to talk to you about that a moment. Repentance. He came to call us to repentance. There is no salvation without repentance. We must be sorrowful for our sin. We must be willing to repent. To repent is to say, on one side of it, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And, and godly sorrow works repentance. When we are truly sorrowful for our sin, we, we will express that sorrow in apologizing for our sin. I'm so sorry, God, that I've broken your law. I'm so sorry that I've spent all my time going my own way. I'm so sorry, Lord, that I have given myself to sin rather than, than giving myself to righteousness. But it's not only a statement of sorrow. No, that's, that's not all 
Repentance is, it's not only a, a statement of sorrow, it is a change in direction. I've often said it like this, repentance is walking. You may be walking away from God, walking toward destruction, walking toward judgment, but with that change of, of attitude, with that sorrow, with that confession of sin, we also turn away from sin the, the direction we've been going, the things we've been doing, and we walk toward God. That's why that old song is so so relevant to people who are saved. Things I used to do, I don't do no more. Things I used to do, I don't do no more. Things I used to do, I don't do no more. For the Lord made a change. In me, oh yes, things I used to say, places I used to go, I don't do no more. For the Lord has made a change in me, in my repentance. I'm not only extremely and sincerely sorrowful for my sin, but I am determined by God's help, I am going to change directions. Christ came to call us to repentance, to call us to a change of mind, a change of attitude. I don't want to live that way anymore. I don't want to be caught up in the destruction of sin anymore. And not only saying it, but actually making a change in our lives. Now, you cannot change your way and get the attention of God and be saved. That's, that's not how it works. You're never going to be good enough to be saved. You, you're never going to do good enough. You're not going to do enough good works. You can't give enough money. You can't be kind enough to people. You can't be, you can't love up on God and earn God's favor. That's not how it works. God doesn't save people because they become good. People become good because they're saved. And, and, and here's, here's a fine line. We, we know we cannot be saved, or we ought to know we cannot be saved just because we're good. And so some people say, okay, just repent and never worry about being good. But that's not scriptural either. That's, that's taking advantage of grace and saying, just because there's a lots of grace because I sin, let's sin a whole bunch more so there's more grace. There's, there's, no, there's no spiritual, scriptural grounds for that. In fact, it is forbidden in scripture to take advantage of grace by sinning more. God forbid. However, once we are saved and we repent of our sin, it, it really puts something in us not to earn the favor of God, but just to be God-like the best we can. We don't, we don't want to live in sin. We don't, we don't want all those old habits. We, we don't want to go all those old places. Sin was not kind to us. Therefore, we want to leave it behind. Hallelujah. He came to call us to repentance, a change of mind and a change of direction. I, I ran across a story by uh, Dr. Fuller. He was pastor of a Baptist church in Atlanta. And later he was the Southern Baptist, uh, president of the Southern Baptist, Baptist Seminary. He said he made a call on a fine Christian home. And in that home was a fine Christian mother. And she had a story to tell about her two boys. Her older son was unhealthy. He, was, he, he suffered from some physical affliction. And so the younger son, he was, he was robust, he was healthy, he was strong, and soon he outgrew his older brother. Now, he could not outgrow the fact that he was the younger brother. He, he couldn't change that. But he was bigger, he was stronger, he was taller, he had more energy, more breath than his older brother. And he picked on his older brother. Now this mother, she was very firm. This is not right. You can't do this. And she was firm in her punishment. 
It would only last a little while and she would catch him picking on his older brother again. One day she walked into a room just a few days before Dr. Fuller came to visit the home. She walked into a room just in time to see the younger brother slap the older brother very hard. And then he saw his mother. He froze when he saw his mother. He knew that he had been punished over and over for what he had just done. And he knew he wasn't supposed to do it. He froze. The mother said she froze too. She stood there and looked at him. By and by, the boy's head dropped in shame. And mom walked out of the room. A little while afterward, she heard him come in the room behind her where she was working. She could hear him shifting nervously from one foot to the other. Finally, he said, Mama, can I help you in some way? Is there something I can do for you? And I told him, no, son, I do not need anything. I knew what he wanted. He wanted to, he wanted to help me with the housework to earn my favor. Maybe, maybe mama won't be so mad at me if I help her with some of the chores. But I didn't have anything for him to do. Half an hour went by. I was sewing. I heard him come in again. I felt so sorry for him. I wanted to embrace him. He said, Mama, the wood box is about empty. Can I get you some wood and fill it up? I had to wait a moment before answering because there was a lump in my throat. And I said, no, son, I don't think we'll need any more wood today. I heard him turn around and start out. He got as far as the door and stopped again. And I looked around and when I did, he burst into tears, sobbing. He came running and put his arms around my waist and he said, mama, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me for slapping my brother. I will never do it again. And Dr. Fuller said, that's exactly what God wants to hear us say when we pray. Don't just say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Tell God you're sorry and I'm not going to do it again. And don't lie to him. Be honest with him. The man who repented most in the Bible, and I have preached this for years across the country. The man who said, I've done wrong more than anybody else in the Bible, publicly or privately said, I'm wrong. I shouldn't have done that, was King Saul. He repeated, repeatedly realized that was stupid. I shouldn't have done that. That was sinful. That was against God. But he never made a change. Saul died a godless death. He said, I'm sorry. He said, I, I, I want to do better. I shouldn't have done that. But he never changed. He never allowed God to change him on the inside. That young man, that boy, illustrates so well how that repentance must be followed through with doing. I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn from my ways and then do it. I love this verse in 1 John, little John, 1 John chapter 1. If you want to know how to get God's attention, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins. He, God, is faithful. Oh, hallelujah. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He's righteous. He's faithful and he's righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, hallelujah. Repentance that says, I'm guilty, Lord. So many times people come to the altar and they pray for a night. They pray for a second night. They pray for a third night. They get up. They never get saved. They never get saved. 
Yet somebody comes to the altar at the same time they do. They pray a simple, sincere prayer of repentance. Mean it from their heart. God changes them, opens their eyes to righteousness, realize how sinful they were. And they're a brand new creature. What happened? One got it. One didn't even get close. One man said, the problem is the first guy comes and says, oh Lord, you, I mean, I need to be saved and, I, and, and I've, I've been righteous and I've done this and I've done. He's pleading his case before the judge of all judges. But the second man pleads guilty. Lord, I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. Listen, if you're struggling with sin, I don't call you a sinner. No, no, you know what sin does to you. I say to you that you can be righteous. You can be changed. You can be a brand new man, a brand new woman. Behold, all things are passed away. Passed away and behold, all things are become new through repentance. Faith in Christ, that Christ paid the penalty for your sin. Faith in Christ, that Christ gave his life died in your place for your sin, for my sin, nailed our sins to the cross. Repent of those sins. I'm sorry, Lord. And I want you to help me be a brand new man and he will do it. How many can say he's done it for you? How many can, how many can give me a witness? God has done it for me. He's called the sinner to repentance. Oh, what a beautiful word for this Wednesday. Thank you for joining us. Hey, if you got questions about it, leave them in the comments. Go find our email. Send us an email. I'd love to talk to you about it because he will save you. Yes, he will. I know he will. He, he loves to do it. God bless you, friend. Come back and see us again next Wednesday.